So now that I have your attention, I'm going to tell you how such a universally reviled symbol came to rule my life. For the sake of convenience, if my memoir is ever published, I request it be under the title Alternate 21328 in the now outdated Windows XP. This input results in the symbol that you're seeing now. I recently became aware that a story posted by an old acquaintance of mine whose name is John, but whom you may know as Jack, has for some time been circulated in certain corners of the internet. Let me start off by saying that John understood very little. I feel grossly mispresented by his story. So, I've decided to contribute my own side of the events that led up to and follow the early months of 2007 when his story takes place. For those of you who may wonder why I would go through the effort to do something like this, I hope that the restoration of my reputation, at least in the eyes of some of you, will be as significant a reason as any I may give. Now, as far as I've been able to tell, for as long as mail and telegrams and the like have been around, the game, as it's most often referred to, has existed in some form or another. In old Europe, stories of Foxfire and the Will-O-Wisp may refer to the phenomena surrounding it. Even modern media narratives like the movie Drag Me to Hell or the Japanese animated series Jigoku Shiojo seem to be retellings or reimaginings of its ancient legends in its various forms around the world. For me, however, the game began in early 2005, in the waning months of my sophomore year in high school. I was a lot like anyone else at that time, a young, idealistic student with hopes and dreams and visions of a bright future. I could never have conceived at that time that my destiny would be redefined by a bunch of spoiled brats and their ill-advised curiosity for occult rituals. I was a good student. I'd even go as far as to say I was great. I got high marks and always did my homework. I was responsible. I never touched alcohol or cigarettes or drugs and I stayed clear of the students who did. I always thought it would be enough to keep me out of trouble. But I was not so fortunate. It was Wednesday, April 20th, 2005. The irony, or perhaps the appropriateness of this date may not be lost on those who know your history. A number of students from my school were having a party and smoking weed together to mark the date. I, of course, was not invited, as I did not partake in such events, nor did I associate with those who did. Among those who were in attendance was a somewhat disagreeable girl named Kaylee Hernandez. Kaylee is still remembered fondly in decrepit MySpace memorials as a bright, and cheerful, carefree girl who brightened people's days with her smile. All of that irritating nonsense that people make up just because they died or disappeared in order to make them sound like a good person. But to me, she'll always just be the bitch who ruined my life. I can only guess as to what exactly happened. But I imagine that, at the party, under the influence of alcohol and weed, she and her friends got together to look up spooky occult rituals on the internet. Whatever the case, I was awakened by the vibration of my cell phone at about 1am. I remember sleepily rolling over and flipping open the phone, its soft blue glow illuminating my room in the darkness. I had one text message from Kaylee Hernandez. Welcome to the game. At the time, I thought very little of it. I was tired, and I thought it was just some bizarre ritual drunken teenage girls undertook in the wee hours of the morning. I even wondered if it was some kind of roundabout way of saying she fancied me, although I had no interest in her or her ilk. I went back to sleep. The next day, things began getting strange. 
I dismissed it at the time as tricks of the light, but walking to school and all day in class, I felt as if I was being watched or followed. I would see the briefest glimpses of black shadows or glowing lights in the corner of my eye. Whenever I looked more closely, I found nothing. On top of that, my cell phone began acting up. I can't remember what exact model it was, but it was a Motorola, and for the time it was pretty good. I had a web browser, data plan, all the bells and whistles. I didn't receive any more text messages, but I started getting a lot of glitchy notifications and nonsense text. I also noticed I had a new app, which I had no memory of installing. Between classes that day, I went to the bathroom to fiddle with it. Cell phones were, of course, confiscated on site if the teachers caught you using them in class, so I dared not do that in the middle of English class. I checked out the new app, thinking it might be a virus that Kaylee had attached to her text. I was taken to a browser menu with a list of four glowing hyperlinks. The text of the links were all nonsense, more indecipherable gibberish. I decided to follow the first one, my curiosity at its peak. I was immediately shown an elaborate map that looked like a GPS. At the center, my position glowed in the school bathroom. A few other beacons glowed around the map, but I had no clues as to what they may be. The truth is, I was upset and worried that I'd accidentally purchased some sort of expensive GPS function for the phone, or worse, perhaps someone was tracking me now through the virus. I immediately turned off my phone and put it away, resolving to deal with it later. And I wouldn't learn until later that this was a serious error. As school went on that day, my visions increased in frequency and intensity. I began experience auditory, as well as visual hallucinations. The brief balls of light, or shadow that had vanished before at my gaze, now lingered long enough for me to look directly at them albeit only for an instant before they disappeared. The sounds were like hissing, scratching, or perhaps static, or white noise. I began to feel physically ill and thought I may have been getting sick. I decided to go home early. I started walking. It seems, however, that Kaylee and a couple of her friends took notice. She slipped out of class and confronted me on the way with her two friends, Gabriella and Anastasia. Both of them were an eyesore, but I'll spade the details. Yo, fag, what you up to? She said as I was passing by her, the weird sisters at her side laughing mockingly, as if what she said was somehow hilarious. I had been hoping to ignore her, but it seemed it would be impossible. She pulled out her cell phone and began fiddling with the keys. None of your business, Kaylin. I came back and continued walking. You need to learn some respect, one of the others said. I can't remember if it was Gabriella, the fat one, or Anastasia, the one with bad teeth. I ignored her and kept moving. But suddenly, I felt incredibly weak, as if the blood had all rushed out of my head. I lost my balance and fell to the ground. I think I may have been briefly unconscious, but I wasn't too sure. When I came to, I saw Kaylee staring at me with her ugly friends. Dumbass doesn't even know how to keep his phone on. Thanks for the time, douchebag. I sat up. They were really getting on my nerves. Yeah, like I'd give you sluts the time of day anyway. What the hell did you do? What did you do to my phone? Oh, you'll find out soon enough. Or maybe you won't. If I were you, I'd keep it on though. Not like it matters, you don't stand a chance in hell anyway. Kaylee smirked at me as she sauntered off with her flunkies. I didn't know what she was on about, and I ignored her. Later that night, I got home and turned my phone back on and started trying to figure it out. I couldn't get the new application to go away, but going through it, I checked the various links. Again, the first one displayed the map. I found that I could zoom in and out. I saw my position in my bedroom in my house when I was zoomed all the way in. The map was detailed enough to have the floor plan. When I zoomed out... I saw the other parts of the city, and where the other beacons were on the map. After the day's events, I just wanted to be on the safe side, and I decided I would check some of them out the following day. This time, I also checked the three hyperlinks on the app's home menu. 
The second one brought up a list of other links, but these were all greyed out. The third one led me to another screen that was all gibberish. More incomprehensible symbols floating across the screen. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. As for the fourth link, it was completely greyed out, and I couldn't even begin to access it even if I wanted to. I left my phone charging, went to bed and slept. Throughout the night, I had more brief visual and auditory hallucinations, and my sleep was full of nightmares I can no longer remember. School the next day was more of the same. Kaylee wasn't even in class. On the way home, I decided to investigate one of the beacons on the map. It was a glowing blue icon in an apartment complex near my family's house. When I arrived at the apartment, I found that the blinds were closed and the inside was dark. Having resolved that I didn't walk all that way for nothing, I knocked on the door. There was no answer. I tried again, more forcefully. And again. Finally, I was about to leave when I started hearing a series of deadbolts unlocking from the inside. A stout, heavy-set man with spiked hair who looked to be about 20 answered the door, but he left the chain lock in place. Hey kid, what do you want? Hey, I was hoping you could tell me something about this. I held my cell phone up and showed him the map pointing to his apartment. His eyes narrowed. Did you send the message to anyone else yet? The message? I don't know what you're talking about, my phone just started acting up yesterday. Come to think of it, I think it started because of a girl at my school. It's been happening ever since she sent me a text at around 1am a few nights ago. Is that what you mean by message? I haven't sent it to anyone. He paused for a moment and looked at me thoughtfully, as if he was trying to decide if he believed me. At length, he closed the door, undid the chain and opened it up to let me inside. He bolted the door behind me. I felt a bit nervous, wondering if I had just stumbled into a trap, but then he began to speak. You're going to rule the day you got that message for the rest of your life, kid. No matter how long or short it may be. We talked for hours that day. He said his name was Starlov, and he explained to me that I had been brought into a game from which there was no escape. He told me that I would be dead in a few days unless I could find an object that could protect me. An object? What, you mean like a charm or something? Like the Chinese exorcists wear on their hats? Yeah, not exactly, kid, he said. He told me the item could be anything, but that whatever it was, it would cause me terrible anguish. Then he told me about his. He patted his knee. I've always loved basketball, you know. I was the best once. Then this. It was this or die. Looking back, I guess it was a small price to pay, though. He had a knee replacement, an older, primitive model, which caused him great pain when the weather was bad, or sometimes for no reason at all. His hopes of being a basketball player were smashed, and he was left, in his words, an alcoholic schmuck. He told me if I didn't find the thing I needed, I'd be dead in two weeks. At this point, I decided the whole thing sounded crazy. I rebunked him and saying he was talking nonsense. I don't know what they are, or where they come from. I've seen glimpses of them, I still do, out of the corner of my eye. I can tell by the look on your face. You've seen them too. The hallucinations, I started. He interrupted me. They're not hallucinations. I can assure you. They are quite real and they will find you. And they will take you away unless you take what I'm saying seriously. He went over a lot of the details with me for the dark chain of murder in which I was now shackled. He told me about the rule that stated if I sent someone else the message, I could get an extension of time, but that this person would also be roped in. And this is what Kaylee had done to me. And how each time you did this, you brought yourself only half as much time as you did before. So eventually, it would get to the point where you brought yourself almost no time at all. He also told me 
that I had to keep my phone on at all times and make sure I had reception, or else I'd be weak and defenseless to the other players. This reminded me of Kaylee and my confrontation with her. There's something else, I said. Kaylee, the other day, on the way home from school when my phone was off, she did something to me. I felt like I was losing energy. She, she said something like, thanks for the time, and then left. Starlove's face became very serious. Oh, that's not good at all, she must be a time thief. I was confused. What do you mean by time thief? Starlove explained that everyone in the game had an ability which could help them in some way or another, and that players were vulnerable to this when their phones were off, or if they had no reception. Evidently, Kaylee had taken advantage of her ability, which he called Time Thief, to steal some of my remaining days for herself. He reasoned that instead of two weeks, realistically, I had nine days left. If she's doing that, that means she hasn't found the thing she needs yet. That must be why she's cursing people. Ah, oh, shit, this isn't good. Have you tried your own ability yet? Once again, my confusion grew. My own? No, I haven't. How would I even do that? He took me back to the second option on the main screen. The one where before, I had only seen greyed out links of indecipherable text. He scrolled down the list until he found the one that was blue. Instead of gibberish, it was a symbol. A symbol that looked like an eye. Eh, you're a pretty lucky guy. Give it a go. I selected the link and pushed enter. Suddenly my phone vanished. So did my hands. I looked down at myself and found I wasn't even there. Only two indentations of the shape of my feet were in the carpet beneath me. I was shocked, I fumbled with the phone and dropped it in surprise. As soon as I did so, I became visible again, as did the phone. Huh, <laughs> not bad. You can use that whenever you like, but be careful. The stealth function is hell on battery life. All at once I was amazed, excited, terrified, all mixed into one. This was technology I had never seen or heard of before. Or maybe it was magic. But whatever it was, the reality of the ability set in. I was forced to accept everything else Starloff had told me, and that it must have been true. I had no doubts now that I really was in some kind of perverse game of electronic tag, with consequences that are unimaginable. Okay. I said. Please, how do I find the object that can protect me? He paused for a moment. He took a deep breath. I suspect in the coming days it will come to you. If you truly want to live, you must mentally prepare yourself to accept it, whatever it is. You will know it precisely because you won't want to know it. Most of the time, Players such as Kaylee refuse their item, and resolve to find other ways, using the game. I thanked him for his time, and he showed me out. As I was leaving, I asked him about the other two options on the app's home screen. He told me that he hadn't been able to make anything of them either, but that we could try to figure it out another time. That is, if such a time came, that I had managed to assume my protection. The next few days at school were torture for me. I had heard Kaylee and her friends had gotten into a big fight over something. But from what I saw, Gabriella and Anastasia were actually being exceptionally nice to her. They were catering to her every whim like she was some kind of princess and they were her handmaidens. They looked terrified of her. My shield came to me on the seventh day. I was walking home on a path that followed the canal when I was approached suddenly by a rough looking girl with a shaved head. She was wearing black leather and had a black eye. Her clothes looked torn and she had a distant look on her face. 
I saw that she was holding her cell phone in her hand. Whoa, are you okay? Who did this to you? What happened? I asked her. She grabbed my shirt and dropped her cell phone. I could see the game's area map application was open on it. I can't take it anymore. I can't do it anymore. Here, you can have it. I quit. She shoved something into my breast pocket and then backed away towards the reservoir. She looked me in the eyes with tears streaming down her face. Then, before I could even think of stopping her, she pulled a handgun from her waistband, shoved it into her mouth and pulled the trigger. Her brains and bits of skull erupted from the back of her head as she fell backwards into the canal. I rushed to the water's edge and looked down at the body as the waters passed over it, turning it red. I reached into my breast pocket and pulled out what she had given to me. It was a red, Nazi armband. I cursed and stuffed it into my bag. I called the police and reported the woman's suicide. They took my statement, but I left out the bit about the armband, and I didn't show it to them. When I got home that night, I put the armband over my pyjamas while I slept. To my surprise, I slept soundly and had no hallucinations. The next days at school were problematic. I found I could wear the armband beneath my jacket and no one would see it and this seemed to work fine. However, I had to change for gym class each day. I tried to hide it and changed in a corner. But given that it was bright red, it was inevitable that someone saw it. The first day I managed to laugh it off and say it was a joke, a novelty item. But day after day, when they saw me wearing it all week, eventually the other students began to spread rumours. One day at lunch I was approached by three students. They held me and tore off my jacket. Everyone could see the swastika emblazoned on my shoulder. They cursed me and beat me severely that day. The school counsellor forced me to come in for a chat in which I tried and failed to explain that I simply needed to wear it. After that I was very careful and managed to avoid expulsion by making sure none of the teachers could see the armband. Even if they knew it was beneath my clothes, I had plausible deniability on my side and they weren't allowed to strip me to see if it was there. This dealt with the problems of the teachers, but the other students were another matter. They all knew it was there, and this was enough for them. As you may already know from John's side of events, they also began to call me by a butchered version of my last name. My own family started giving me trouble too, afraid that I had fallen in with a gang of skinheads. Kaylee seemed to be enjoying my suffering, although it did seem to bother her that I hadn't vanished by the end of the two weeks as she expected. She went out of her way to make my life hell after that, calling me out in public about the Nazi armband. One night, after my two weeks were up, I decided I didn't want to deal with it anymore. I lay down in my bed and pulled off the armband and left it on the nightstand. The hallucination started up again, but I decided to ignore them with all my will. I went to sleep. About an hour later, around midnight, I was awoken by a loud noise. Something had slammed into the front door of the house. I sat up in bed, in the dark, listening. After a few seconds of silence, there was another loud bang on the door. This one louder than the first. I began to shake. Then the third bang came. It was like an explosion, and I had heard the sound of splintering wood. The house's security alarm went off. In a panic, I reached over and grabbed the armband and slipped it back onto my bicep. I could hear my parents awake and shouting from the other room. At length, when I was reasonably sure the sound had stopped, and the only sounds were of my father swearing. 
I left my room to see what had happened. The metal door of the house was dented inwards and barely remained on its hinges. The decorative wooden panelling that had surrounding it was snapped in pieces on the floor. My father turned and looked at me, standing in my pyjamas with the Nazi armband on my shoulder. You! This is your fault! He swore at me. You and your neo-Nazi bullshit! You got gangbangers terrorising my house at night now! I won't have it one more minute, this has gone too far! He threw me out of the house that night, and I was forced to get my own apartment. After that, I decided I would tough it out. That as Starloff had said, if I wanted to live, this is how it had to be. I developed a thick skin. People often accuse me of starting fights later on but I always turn the other cheek. I can honestly say I never returned a single physical attack on my person during high school, except for one. I stared at myself in the mirror and told myself over and over again that I would endure this. I had never been so alone. Finally, sophomore year had ended. I thought maybe I'd finally get some relief in the solitude that summer promised. That ended, however, when I got a message from Starlov late one night. The text of the message simply read, People you know? Attached was a news report of the disappearance of the two girls from my school. Gabriella and Anastasia were missing. I messaged him back. Yeah, friends of Kaylee. I decided she had to be stopped. Not because of any sense of justice or anything, but because I was aching for some payback anyway. And now I could be sure that I had the means and the excuse. I turned on the area map and tracked down her player beacon after watching it leave her house. I wore all black and a leather jacket and a ski mask and approached her on the street after she was leaving a party. She was fucking drunk. Oh, it's you! She laughed at me drunkily. Good, I was in need of some more days. That's not going to work this time, Kaylee. I took off my jacket and showed her the armband. Her eyes narrowed and she seemed to sober up. Give me that. She said hatefully. I don't think so, Kaylin. She took out her phone and fumbled with the buttons. Suddenly, she dashed at me faster than my eyes could see. She hit me centre mass. I went flying back across the pavement. I later understood that she had a new ability that allowed her to move at incredible speed. Fortunately for me, she was a careless slob and the one charge was all her badly neglected and overworked cell phone battery could handle. Her phone's power died out, and she began cursing at it. I had the wind knocked out of me, but I managed to pull myself together to get back on my feet. I opened my own phone and activated the stealth function. I was physically stronger than her, and being invisible only made taking care of her even easier. I struck her from behind and took her phone from her. I threw it on the ground and destroyed it. I pulverized it with the heel of my boot until it was a smashed mess. I took the SIM card with me. I turned off stealth and left Kaylee there, scrambling around to gather bits of her ruined phone. A few nights later, she turned up at my apartment and swore at me. I'm sure she would have attacked me, but I kept the door chained. This didn't stop her from reaching through the door and throwing herself against it, trying to break the chain. She cursed at me again and again. I called the police. She broke down when she heard the sirens coming. 
there were tears in her eyes. She begged me like a worm. She ran off before the police arrived. I never did see her again. She disappeared without a trace that night. MySpace pages wore rest in peace Kaylee banners for a while, and people remembered her fondly as the spunky girl who stood up against that one Nazi bastard who went unnamed. If you've read John's side of the story, then I don't need to go into too much detail about the events of July 2005 to May 2007. As far as I can tell, he seemed to get what little facts he had fairly correct. I will, however, try to fill in some of the holes. Jack transferred at the end of 05, as his story states, our junior year, which was an uneventful year for the most part. I traded messages with Starloff a bit more from time to time, and I tried doing some research on the game in online forums and old legends. But finding nothing of use, I kind of just adapted to life as a hated national socialist. It wasn't easy reconciling with my Christianity. There's a theory sociologists talk about, called labelling theory, which states that if people treat you like something for long enough, you will eventually become the mask. Where once I hated Nazis, I started studying them intensely and found a sort of fascination with them. As I sit here type in this memoir, various artifacts from the war litter the room and Nazi propaganda posters stare down at me. Labelling theory or not, I can never really get away with who I was or who I really wanted to be though. I developed a sense of self-loathing for a while and tried punishing myself or trying to purify myself through physical pain. I practiced some self-flagellation for a bit, but I've since moved past all that. I've seen some speculate that maybe I was using torture devices as a decoy for my shield, but admittedly, I never really thought about it that much. I'm not that smart. Since then, however, I have toyed with the idea of a decoy shield, in case another Stephanie ever comes along. On that note, I just want to say that Stephanie Chung was an even worse person than Kaylee. Her relationship with John was never as good as he portrayed in his version of events. They did date, on and off, and he did love her, but her treatment of him was abusive at times. I doubt they actually ever had sex, despite what he may have said. Although to be fair, I can attest to the fact that the night she vanished, she did in fact threaten me with his gun when she came to my apartment and it wouldn't be a surprise at all if she did sleep with him that night, just to get her hands on it. As for why his story contained no traces of her using any of the special abilities or the app menus, she likely hid it all from him. I'm not sure what her shield item would have been, or even if one presented itself to her, although I do have my suspicions. Her problem may have been as simple as not having a data plan, or a cell phone that was advanced enough. Whatever the reason may be, the only method she ever used to extend her time was the practice of sending the message out to more people, and this method quickly ran her out of time. She never interacted with her victims in the same way that Kaylee did with me. So in the end, no one ever saw it coming. If any of them got the game app, they must have written it off as a glitch like I first did. Some people mourn her, some people miss her. That bitch got exactly what she deserved. Nevertheless, the whole affair served as something of an eye-opener to me. I realised new dangers that the game posed to me, frankly the fabric of society. Starloff and I began devoting a great deal of our time to attempt to understand the game, if it is possible to quit, or end it, what it means, where it came from, why it even exists in the first place. On most of these fronts we've yet to turn up anything, 
However, we did discuss something about the third function on the app's menu. What we had both thought to be a strong and meaningless text actually has a pattern to it. The symbols recycle themselves over and over again, and each time they complete a full circle, they get smaller. It's a countdown, ticking away towards some event. As of this time, we did not have any evidence as to what it may be. Jason Radermacher